We're opening the meeting. Um, Council acknowledges that we're meeting on traditional country, the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, and we pay respect to their elders past and present. <clears throat> of course, some of us may be participating on the traditional country of other Aboriginal peoples, and we'd like to acknowledge them as well. We rec recognise and respect their cultural her heritage, beliefs, and their relationship with the land. We acknowledge they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups who will be watching this recording. Uh, I have no apologies or leaves of absence. Um, and that takes us to item three, confirmation of the minutes. Um, can I have a mover and a seconder to move that those minutes are a true and accurate record of our last committee meeting? Moved, Councillor Noel, seconded, Councillor Kira. Councillor Noel, do you wish to speak? No, Councillor Kira, do you wish to speak? No, uh, members, any speakers? Let's look for the longest one. Okay, I'm now unmuted. Um, uh, I'll put that to the vote. Members, those in favour, please raise your virtual hands now. That is carried. Yeah. And please lower them as well. <laughs> Councillor, that, that's right, Jenny can do it. Excellent. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, thank you, members. We're getting the hang of this. Wish, with that, I'll uh, go to presentations, which there are new, and then we'll go to uh, reports uh, that will be presented to Council. We start with 5 1, the Adelaide Aquatic Centre Needs Analysis Consultation uh, results. Um, uh, and we'll go to Tom to give us a preamble for this. Thank you, presiding member. Um, tonight we're presenting two reports, 5.1 and 5.2 on the agenda relating to the Adelaide Aquatic Centre. Um, the first report you have before you is in response to the needs analysis, um, the draft needs analysis where we undertook consultation. It was a 13 week period or a 92 day consultation period probably the longest consultation the council has ever undertook in regards to uh, with the community. Um, it was pleasing to see that uh, we had substantial response rates on both consultation, but in this one in particular, uh, some of the themes that came out was that the centre was well loved, well used, and there was a lot of sentiment associated with the facility itself. So what I would like to do is uh, present the report tonight and open it up to any questions. Naturally, what we wish to do is once we have this established, we wish to provide this to the uh, consultant in regard to finalising the needs analysis to bring it back to council for consideration and potentially a workshop. Uh, thank you for that, Tom. Am I still... Well, I'm talking, yeah, good. Um, and with that, I'd just like to remind members that we're not debating anything tonight. And I just remind members as well that this is on the needs analysis, not the AFC um, uh, unsolicited bid, which is of course 5.2, the next item. With that, um, uh, Councillor Martin, you have your hand up. We'll go to you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, yeah, look, uh, just a, a couple of questions. The first one is, is the administration saying that this needs analysis represents a way forward in terms of the redevelopment of the aquatic centre, or is it kaput as the Crow's proposal is? Tom, please. <laughs> Through you, presiding member, in response to that, uh, the, the information that's provided within the needs analysis and the consultation that we're undertaken can be brought into the final draft need, or the final needs analysis and can be used as valuable information to actually bring back to council and understand how people actually interact with the centre, how they get to the centre, and what sort of activities they actually want to see or use within the facility. So it's actually invaluable in regards to the information and we can actually build on that. 
Uh, yeah, that wasn't the question. Um, we know how, from the survey, people feel about the centre, but is the administration saying that, given that there were options outlined in the uh, consultation, is this the way forward in terms of option one, two, three, or four being a way for council to put forward now that the Crow's proposal is dead? Through you, presiding member, there were four options provided in the draft needs analysis. The information that's provided here can be woven into all four options. What it will then talk to is how that option may look based on the demand and based on the activities that people actually require or wish to see in the facility. Okay, is it possible that there are additional options that are available as a result of the consultation? Um, potentially there could be. However, what I would like to do is present uh, the findings of the survey to the consultant so that we can actually bring it back and actually workshop with the council and then see if any options present themselves beyond the four options provided in the draft needs analysis. Um, and in respect of uh, one of the uh, consultant's efforts at page 69, um, a number of uh, visitors to the centre were asked, did they require further information about <laughs> um, uh, the needs analysis? Yep. Uh, and where they requested more information, we have published the names, email addresses, and in one case, the home address of people who simply wanted to be kept informed. W was that deliberate or is that just an oversight uh, that's led to this breach of privacy? Um, through you, Prospective Member, you're referring to, I think, Section 13 of the one-to-one uh, -one sessions where there were 71 email addresses provided. That was a human error and was actually redacted and removed from the public uh, information and was uh, actually removed uh, yesterday. I see. Uh, so that's not in the public realm. Councillors are the only ones who have that information. It hasn't been published at all. We have removed it from the council website and that, that is the means where people actually get access to council documents and it's actually been redacted. I see. So uh, will there be an apology issued to the individuals whose names and addresses were published? That would be our intention, uh, councillors, should, uh, should that come through. We've actually apologised to the person who actually pointed that out to us. And we've, we thank them for uh, uh, informing us of that. And actually, it was a human error uh, because it was in the body of the document, but we're happy to do that. Thank you. Yes, uh, that would be good. And just one final question. Uh, I note from the documentation that had the Crow's proposal proceeded, Blackfriars School, which holds a lease on Park 2, would have required a substantial um, uh, uh, relocation uh, of their activities. Can you take me through that just um, in broad detail? So can you reference the page in particular that you're talking to, Councillor? Um, yes, I can, if you just give me a moment. Um, can you just take me through the broad detail of that? Well, effectively, uh, Blackfriars request, as you're aware, they, there's a late current lease in place. Uh, what Blackfriars were trying to establish was first and foremost to, to maintain or enhance two, two, two real facilities, one was cricket, and the other one was they have a very substantial uh, water polo and recreational services that they actually use. Um, naturally, Blackfriars requests would be taken in the light of any discussions with any proponent, but as you're aware and you've indicated, Councillor, the Adelaide Football Club was withdrawn from the process. So naturally what would happen, uh, should we consider that in regards to any future centre that would be brought back to Council for review and consideration? However, the items that they've highlighted would come with a significant cost as well. Uh, now, look, I can't, I can't find that. I did see it uh, within the papers. But what they were proposing was that council builds for them a new facilities building as well as new ovals and so on on Park 4 uh, to compensate for them being removed from Park 2. 
uh, through you, presiding member, I think what Blackfriars were trying to achieve was not necessarily council, but someone to uh, basically build uh, the facilities as listed. Um, and whether that is the proponent or whether that is council or whatever model council wishes to adopt, but that was their request and that would be considered by council as we understand what the needs analysis would actually look like. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, Councillor Moran, your hand is up. We'll go to you now. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just noticed, uh, just on another matter, I just noticed that the Lord Mayor had a paper um, agenda. I haven't been able to download the, because I always use a paper agenda. Could I request that I have a copy in paper as well? Um, yeah, the only thing I, I want I don't to think, uh, the, the Lord Mayor just has a three page one sheet. Um, Summary. It's not. It's not. It's not a full agenda. Uh, well, I just want to point out that the cost of buying sort of second laptop would uh, be far, far outweigh the cost of running off a few paper agendas from a few dumb people that still like to use it. Um, can I just go back to Tom and say how I was unaware of this breach of confidentiality? How many people were involved? Uh, through you, presiding. Through you, presiding member, the document that was printed is a, as part of the attachment. It was the one-on-one -on -one survey, and item 13 of the document just indicated uh, 71 people who required further information. It didn't didn't print off all their names. Some people just give their uh, a name, a, either a forename or a surname, and an email address. There was no addresses attached to it. Um, we subsequently, as soon as we were informed of it, we uh, redacted and removed it, and we went back to the gentleman and apologised for the human right. error. All I want to know is how many people um, of that 71 had their identity clearly um, pointed out? Was it 10 and the rest just had a... Is it 71 people that have given their email address and well, their copy? No, to, to answer your question, Councillor Moran, and I've got it in front of me, there's probably about 20 of the 71 that have only given the first name, the others have given the first name and the last name. There are emails for everyone, and there is one person who also included their address in the field where they were expecting to give their name, and there is one person who gave no name but an email address. Alex, could you repeat that? Of the figure 71, how many people would be traceable? Or identify Tom. Member, Councillor Moran, the best way we would respond to this, as I indicated to uh, Councillor Martin, is we've got the email addresses of those individuals and we use that as the format to actually respond to them. How many? Uh, the, we've got 71. But there, there, are 71, there are 71 emails, but there's only one person who's also provided their address. So if you want to talk about who's traceable, there's only one person with the address. An email address is an address, uh, with all due respect. Um, so you have broken confidentiality of 71 people. For how long were their names up on the website? First of all, through you, presiding member, councillor, I didn't breach confidentiality. Uh, this was a human error that was picked up. Um, and effectively, uh, I, I'm not aware of when the report goes out but it was actually withdrawn yesterday. And I think that was drawn just around early lunchtime. And we responded back to the gentleman and thanked them for notifying us. And that related to an item under question 13. And was that, one -to -one. Sorry, Tom, was that response as soon as you were informed of this or was this Correct. out? Right. Correct. Mm, it's very unsatisfactory, but okay, I'll leave it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, any further questions or commentary on this report? There being none, we will go to 5-2, the Adelaide Football Club draft proposal with consultation results. And again, I'll pass to Tom to uh, lead us in on this one. Through you, presiding member, as indicated at the start, this was the second par uh, parcel of work that we undertook for a 13-week process in regards to consultation on the draft concept plans provided by the Adelaide Football Club. Uh, we posed three questions and uh, we uh, basically asked people to respond to those questions using the USA website. What you have before you at the minute 
is basically a representation of how people responded on the USA website, but we also captured emails and any other documents that came through. Please note that uh, you know, this is, the purpose of this was first stage of consultation was to provide the community with an initial opportunity to view the proposal in its early stages of development and provide their feedback. Um, I think it's important to note uh, that community engagement is not a vote. It's not a vote, it's actually as a responsive council request and whatever form that it comes in, we're able to consider that um, in its fullest. Um, naturally, if we were to progress with any, uh, any proponent and whatever, we would go out to final consultation. Uh, so what you have before you is a, a very full document representing the USA website, emails, representation in regards to people and how they've responded. Thank you, Tom. We have Councillor Sims followed by Councillor Martin. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, look, one of the things that uh, leapt out uh, at me in the report, which I'm keen to explore with you, Tom, was the decision not to um, include many of the um, submissions that came uh, via APA um, on the basis that they had been um, unduly influenced by an external organisation. At least that, that seemed to be the argument um, that was put in the um, administration comment. I'm just trying to understand the rationale um, behind that, because surely it's commonplace that when there's a consultation such as this adopted, there will be uh, organisations on both sides that will um, encourage people to put in submissions. I don't really see what, what the problem is with that. Why, why were these submissions discounted? So, through you, presiding member, these uh, submissions were not discounted. Um, I believe there's been some commentary in regards to this. Um, uh, we've included emails, hard copies, um, those who completed the USA website platform, and we've provided the full context of that information within the body of the report. However, the tool that we use in regards to consultation, which is used by other government, uh, sorry, government agencies and councils, is the USA website. The council endorsed that as the tool or the vehicle to receive that. What we've got within the body of the report is we've responded to those who have used the USA website. You can see that within the graphs in regards to the appendix of the report. However, we've captured all the other information in regards to the links. So we have captured that information. But you haven't actually, you haven't actually though uh, included those submissions in terms of uh, the total of those who um, believe that the proposal had met the guiding principles uh, and uh, those that believe that it did not. I and mean, that's what it says in the report. So in response to that and through the presiding member, uh, for, first and foremost, it was very, very challenging and difficult to be able to do that. You had clear questions to respond to. So uh, the reality of that is certain people choose not to respond to those questions, but responded differently. So we've captured that. However, it's very hard for us to assess that against a set criteria within the USA website. Other people just generally sent in emails. The other challenge that we had, Councillor, was that we had people send in multiple emails and also completing the USA uh, website and the survey. So the reality is, how did we actually capture that in regards to actually validating it? Um, there's also people who have sent things in without any identification, typically, Council doesn't take anonymous submissions. And then we had other parties who decided for whatever reason to pre-populate documents and send them in as a whole. But we've tried to capture all that information. I think the most important thing to actually realize is community consultation isn't about a vote. It's actually capturing the information for council to consider uh, in its fullest, and then they can make a decision moving forward. So it isn't a poll at all. Uh, no, and well, there, there was a poll done by um, APA, which was very representative. So that, that work was already done. But I guess I'm just keen to understand how many were excluded on the basis that they were influenced by APA, because that, that's the, uh, the term that's used in the, um, in the paper. Um, so I'm just wanting to get a, a sense of, uh, of how that may well have changed the, the outcome of the consultation. Okay, so for, for, first and foremost, uh, 
it depends what you're talking about, the outcome of the consultation. So councils recommended website or survey tools, you say website. If everyone had responded to that, we would be able to assess based on the questions, how people actually rated the, the draft, either the draft concept plan from the Adelaide Football Club, and also indeed the needs analysis. However, there was 475 Apple pam pamphlets received. The problem was we could not validate or verify these submissions as they were not individually registered on the USA website. Um, there's an assertion whether these respondents had participated more than once through, through the multiple to load the consultation results. So the reality is it was quite difficult for us. However, we have captured it within the body of the report to say we did receive this. Also, what we did capture in the body of the report was to say that the community was divided in regards to its views on the AFC and that draft proposal. We've clearly stated that. Um, we've tried to represent it, but uh, apologies if people don't use something that we can verify and they use other means to submit. All we can do is recognise that in the narrative and the commentary and present it to Council for consideration. Uh, look, I'm not having a go at you, Tom. No, no, I, understand I, it was, I understand it would have been very difficult. I, I guess, uh, by way of explanation, that the thing that I'm concerned about it is, to me, this is akin to saying to a, an elector, well, you know, you followed a how-to-vote card, so we're not going to consider your vote. Um, just because somebody has followed a pro forma from an external organisation doesn't mean that um, their submission should not be um, considered. Uh, because they've taken the time to put in the application and if they've sent it in using the, the pro forma, that's an endorsement of those principles. I mean, do you agree with that? So, Councillor, uh, in response to that and through the presiding member, uh, I think, as I indicated, the information that's been provided by, uh, by people outside uh, in the community, they've used various formats. So the USA website is one, People have decided to send emails in regards to their views. We've attempted to capture that within the links. If you look at the links within the document, we tried to capture all the information. The problem is, is how do you actually determine uh, where people actually sit in relation to this? Because council endorsed a set criteria in regards to the questions and how we we're going to actually assess them. And it was on the basis of strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree and strongly disagree. Some people quite simply put in the unsolicited proposal from the Adelaide Football Club for corporate headquarters on the park and should be rejected and council should pursue other alternatives to continue providing aquatic facilities. That is a valid point. We've captured that. Uh, however, it was very hard to bring that through the USA yeah, website. Yeah, you ca captured it, but it's not considered in the actual totality of the those who are in favour and those who were against in terms of the proposal meeting the guiding principles. So, Councillor, I think through the presiding member, again, I would come back to say is, how do we know if they strongly agree, disagree? How do we know they've even considered the draft assessment if it's been pre-populated? Have yeah. people actually looked at the documents or have they just been responded to because they were asked to? Okay, no, look, that's fine, Tom. I won't, I won't keep exploring it. I guess for me, this does cast a, a bit of a shadow over the um, consultation process. I had concerns around it beforehand in terms of the way that it was uh, constructed. Um, and I think, when we've got a situation where you've got uh, hundreds of people that have been in effect disenfranchised, and then there's something that's gone wrong in our consultation process that we, we maybe need to reflect on for, for next time. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have Councillor Martin. And uh, Councillor, I would just ask if, if the issues you're going to raise before they get flushed out by Councillor Sims, um, don't make it for the Again, over to you. I can't hear you, it was distorting. Um, look, whenever the administration needs someone to make the unforgivable sound reasonable, it wheels out Tom McCready. And Tom does a great I'm job. I'm not going to a great job. Those sort of slurs I, want to, I want to know, I want to know who in the administration approved the exclusion of the APA contribution of the consultation. Who was it? Was it the CEO? The approving officer is at the top of the report as it is with every report in the city. Who, who was responsible? Who, to whom did it go? The Lord Mayor, the CEO? You'll see, and 
knowing the structure of the organization as I do, I assume the approval of the P and the P. Is that, is that correct, Tom? Uh, could I just respond to that? Uh, for, first of all, the body of the information that the Council is referring to is contained within the report, as I highlighted to the previous Councillor. Oh, is... Tom, Tom, it's all right. I understand. And look, you do a great job. You, you do the impossible every time. But look, somebody in this organisation has to accept responsibility for trashing our reputation when it comes to public polling. You cannot you cannot say, we are going to find out what the people of Adelaide and South Australia think, and then exclude what they think, and then say, this is not a vote. This is about capturing people's opinion. It's being paraded as a vote. It says a majority of people supported the Adelaide Football Club proposal. The truth is, they didn't. The poll was a shameful manipulation, an absolute disgrace. It has trashed our reputation, it is, to my mind, never, ever trust the city of Adelaide to find out what people are thinking, because all it'll do is tell you what it wants you to know. Now, I, I, I tell you now, when this comes to council for noting, I'll be saying that it's amended, and it's amended to say that we are note, we note that this result has been manipulated. It is a... It is a consultation in name only, and it follows hard on the heels of a faction, a Team Adelaide faction, hell-bent on accommodating the worst ever proposal for the parklands. And you know, it's gone, it's gone, it's finished, and you've done all of that damage, suffered all that reputational damage for nothing, for nothing. It's done, Councillor. And I'll just remind you, you are not allowed to flag amendments. You are not allowed to debate. This is the committee. We've changed our structure. Bill, I can't hear you. You're muted. Thank you. You're not allowed to debate. And if there's any further debate, I will just be muting you immediately. Thank you. Now, next, we have Councillor Moran. Jenny. Thank you. I but I will be giving my opinion on the report. And that is fine. I know. Thank you. Um, it is disingenuous in the extreme to say that this hasn't been a push poll. When we started out on this process, we wanted a yes, no. Um, do you want uh, private commercial buildings in the platforms or don't you? That was fought um, vigorously by the dominant faction on council. So what we got was a rather peculiar um, push poll. And I think, unlike the two previous speakers, it's been an enormously successful consultation. It got exactly the result that was wanted. Enormous support for the AF, uh, 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 football clubs proposal in the part hands. It had to do that by removing most of the votes from, the, from APA and from History Trust. It didn't, however, remove the pro forma letter from the Adelaide Football Club that people just signed their names to. Um, so while I agree that Tom's lovely Irish accent really softens the blow, this is a very, very low point for the Adelaide City Council. It got exactly what people with clear, clear eyes and, and experienced heads said it would. Uh, it is a vote. The advertiser is, is parading it out. Um, as a huge win for football in the park plans or private commercial buildings in the park plans. It has an article tomorrow saying that, that Black Fire Car is fantastically pleased. Um, the whole thing has been a web of uh, confusion and um, I could understand people would see it as maybe perceived as deceit. People really felt strongly about this. And the Your Say website was almost impossible to get into, um, even from quite intelligent people. I've never been able to get into it. But it is a vote, and it will be wheeled out again if the Adelaide Football Club get any money back through the advertisers saying, look, everybody wanted it. It's enormously damaging. And I think before the council meeting, you really have to go back and give one vote, one, one vote, one... Uh, a number 
and show truly the correct number. If Tom can't do it, well then give it to the councillors and we'll have a look through. But this is an absolute outrage. A yes, no vote would have come out clearly no. And some people realise that, so change the consultation. It's not good enough. It does ruin our reputation with our ratepayers. It means that we look untrustworthy. Everybody said this was a push poll and a, and a uh, queered consultation. And it's exactly what we've got. So I'm terribly disappointed. And I know that our ratepayers are too. Thank you. We'll now move on to the Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, look, you know, no surprise, I don't agree with what's being said. It was a huge consultation. It was one of the biggest consultations that we've taken. And we asked three really specific questions. So, you know, the questions, you know, do you think it aligned with the principles? Uh, understanding that it hasn't been um, informed by the draft analysis, what are your views on the proposal and any other feedback, which means everybody could actually have responded the way that they wanted to. Every single response has been captured in this report, including APA's. And the fact that APA encouraged their members not to use the Your Say process, which was the endorsed process of our council, is actually been to their own detriment. Now, it doesn't matter what, you know, if it's a pro forma, it's not answering those questions. And that is actually what the consultation was about. Three questions which we approved of so that we could get the view. You can clearly see that the community has been divided. We understood that from the word go. But the whole point of it was actually to get feedback. This was not a vote. We're not voting one way or the other. It wasn't a decision making thing. It was a consultation to inform us of the views of our community. And all, every single feedback that we got, whether it was by letter or by pro forma or by email or everything, everything that we've got has been included in that report so that councillors can have a look at. If people were doing multiple submissions, which we do know that some people were, that makes it very hard to actually put that into the consultation. If people don't give us their information so we can identify where it's coming from, it makes it very difficult for us to actually include it in that. Because we had a, a um, you know, a accepted international standard for how you do community consultation. And I think that we actually did that consultation well. It doesn't really give up. The result is that the community is split 50-50. Well, you know, we sort of knew that. And so, you know, what we actually wanted was some of their other views. Give us your feedback. What do you think? And um, so all of that's been captured, captured in that. Um, and I actually think that, you know, we, we can't, it, it's not whether we want to disregard it or not. It's very clear uh, that we had um, uh, some, well, we had very clear views one way or the other. But this consultation captures everything that was submitted to us. And I think that's Councillor Sim's point, is that we actually wanted to make sure that we could capture everything that came to us. And then it's up to us to read all that information and make, uh, make our own judgment or our own view. Anyway, so that's, that's uh, my thoughts on it. Um, and uh, looking at the submissions, and I started reading all of the letters and the emails, lots of different views and things like that. But the question were asked in the way that we could capture that. So it was up to everybody to use the tools that we put forward, which was the Your Say um, process. Thank you, Lord. Councillor Moran, have we lost you or is your green screen um, having, having troubles showing you? Councillor Moran, are you, are you with us? Show yourself. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay, okay. You are here. If we could just keep you on screen, um, or if you do have to leave, just let Jenny know so that she can record it in the minutes. Just message her. Um, but otherwise, we'll operate on the basis that you're here. Um, good. Thank you. Uh, that when we are streaming live, we will need to see the image. Yeah. And of course, when we are streaming live, we will need to see the image. And obviously, we'll have to be very careful about what that image is, particularly. Councillor Abraham today. Oops. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I start by thanking administration for taking on a significant task 
this community consultation has been a, a massive, it's, a, it's been a mammoth task. Uh, the questions were clear, the, uh, the intention was clear, uh, and now the results speak for themselves. So um, just because the results are slightly different to uh, some of the other uh, members' perspectives and, and, and their opinions, uh, doesn't mean that it's been done incorrectly. So uh, again, I really want to thank administration for uh, undertaking uh, this task and, uh, and, and doing it well. Thank you, Councillor Abraham today, and we'll go to Councillor Donovan. Thank you. Um, Tom, what was the third question of the consultation? Uh, please provide any further feedback regarding the Adelaide Aquatic Centre uh, football, sorry, the Adelaide Football Club draft proposal contained within your, uh, your say website. Okay, so the third question said to give us any feedback. Yep. So we were prepared to receive any feedback. We Come knew therefore that we would receive a variety of data that would require thematic analysis. We knew that it would be qualitative in nature. We were not simply gonna have yes, no, and that substantial qualitative analysis would be required to draw out the themes of the analysis. And therefore any submission that we received that was presented in that format should have been considered in that way. And I think it's absolutely outrageous, to be honest, that the APA feedback has been put into, well, we have it in some format, because in no other situation where we receive literally hundreds of emails would councillors be expected to wade through that and draw out the themes. And, you know, it's, it's not to labour the point because it's a moot point at this point in time anyway, but I think this sets a very dangerous precedent were we to say that if we receive information from in alternate forms, particularly in a setting like this, in which we said we received a lot of feedback that said uh, it's too hard to access the Your Say website. And so time and time again, we all, councillors, administration said, don't worry, send it by email, send it in whatever form you can, and we will look at it in that form. That was said in multiple forums. I was there when other councillors and when other administrations said that. So I think it's really insufficient that we do not summarise that. And you make the point that, it, that you know, this is not a poll, this is not a vote. 100% right, we would still look to this as one source of input into any decision making. However, if you are going to create data representations, data visualizations as administration has, and within that, those data visualizations which people use to, to absorb information, if you do not include a significant number of, uh, of the proportion of the feedback, then it is misrepresentative. And the reason why in terms of saying, well, we had those three simple questions and they didn't respond to the three simple questions. If the third question is give us your feedback, then clearly that is something that we always anticipated we were going to have to do extra analysis on. The reason people didn't in all instances respond to those very supposedly simple questions is because they were not answering. They were not asking the questions that people wanted to ask, answer and they were not the clear yes, no uh, questions that people wanted to give feedback on. So I take all the points that have been made, but I think if we use this as a precedent for any future consultations and we just say, well, there's you know, almost a thousand responses by email that you can wade through if you want to, that's an unreasonable expectation. It's not providing, we might as well just put an email address and do that for every consultation that we do. We're not doing the thematic analysis that we do in every other consultation so completely inadequate to just dismiss those responses in my opinion. Thank you Tom, do you want to comment on that? Uh, through you presiding member, thank you Councillor Donovan and uh, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. So first of all if I can take you to the body of the analysis what we've tried to do is capture the information that wasn't contained or wasn't submitted through the USA website. And under 4.4, which talks to themes of feedback, it was clear the strongest themes that emerged from the participation 
included the parklands were established for the benefit of the South Australian public. Corporate organisations should not have a presence on the parkland. There's no community benefit from locating a commercial office, so on, so forth. Now, the, the issue for us was, we, this, as I say, this is not a poll. This is about capturing information. The information is presented to council and what council does with that information is effectively up to the elected body. But what we've tried to do is capture the sentiment. It's very hard to actually uh, try to analyze when you're getting emotions or themes coming through and how that relates to the, the questions that were set by council and the mechanism through the USA website. However, I can categorically say in link one of the report, all the individual responses are put in there. Um, we've removed all names and details in regards to who submitted that. And we've also tried to capture the themes of the feedback. This is presented to council to actually consider that feedback. Um, what council does with it is entirely within their own jurisdiction. Uh, but what I would say is, if we had proceeded to another stage, the reality is we would have been going out to consult again. But I do get the sentiment in regards to it, but it was extremely difficult to actually analyze comments that were coming through, which didn't respond to the questions that were posed by council and using the mechanism that council has actually entrusted us to actually monitor and analyze. Well, just a final point on that, because no doubt we will look, we will see these uh, types of consultations again, how would yeah. you expect to analyze, give us your feedback in the future? I, I think, Councillor, I think, uh, first of all, uh, if, if we had our, our moment in the sun again, I think we need to spend a bit more time in regards to the questions that we need to pose. Dare I say, are they yes, no, or a little bit more detail? I also would say is we need to have a direct form, a single form that people can actually respond and we can capture it and analyze it. The amount of emails that come in individually people who were sending multiple emails in, and then when we're checking it and saying that they filled out the USA uh, website survey as well, the reality is, do we take that as one submission or do we take it as two, three, four submissions? It was extremely difficult, but I do say that- the valid points, Tom. However, if you're going to give a data representation that says X percent agree and X percent don't mm -hmm. agree, then that's inaccurate. So the data that you've presented is inaccurate and better to say, here's hundreds of emails, wade through it yourself and pull out what you like, in addition to here's the thematic analysis that we've done, rather than to put any, any Council, stuff. Councillor, Councillor, sorry, sorry, Helen, I've just got to pull you up. There's a lot of debate here. We're going to run through it all again next week. Anyway, so we're going to pull up on the debate. Um, just pointing out that it's inaccurate information for us to consider. And if we're going to be considering this at council next week, then it's it's worth us noting that it is inaccurately presented, and that's enough. You can mute me. Councillor Sims. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with that in mind, I wonder whether administration would consider removing um, the section of the report where they do a, um, a qualitative a quantitative analysis and claim that there's X percent that were in favour of the guiding principles and X oh, percent. Sorry, sorry, Rob, the, the short answer to that is no, we can't change reports from committee to council. We meant it council. We can't. It's a question to administration of whether no, 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 Okay. All right. Well, and the, the other point I want to ask is, um, and it's further to Helen's point. Has administration had any thoughts about whether or not we need a clearer policy um, that guides how we might conduct consultations like this in the future? Because it strikes me one of the key problems, and you know, in fairness to administration, it, they were handed a poison chalice by council that um, curtailed most of the options for an open consultation and said, you need to have a narrow consultation, you can only ask these particular questions. But has administration had any thoughts on how that might be managed differently in the future? And will anything be coming to council for us to consider? Because I don't want to see us repeat the mistakes that we've made here. Through you, presiding member. Thank you, councillor, for that question. I think a lessons learnt in regards to looking at how council responds to uh, challenging, uh, challenging issues such as this. And then importantly, what mechanism that we can use to capture that information, to validate that information, and to present it in the best possible light. 
uh, would be something that we would look at. Uh, but again, as I indicated, the way we responded was the council endorsed position with the questions using the current system or the tool through the USA website. Um, however, the, the amount of responses and the amount of responses that came outside of that vehicle was very challenging to manage and nor did it simply respond to the questions uh, that were actually posed. But in saying that, it would be probably of benefit for council and the administration to consider what is the best vehicle moving forward to capture what I would say is challenging or contentious issues such as this. Yeah, uh, because Sorry, Rob, I've just um, got Mark who's put his hand up. Mark, did you want to comment before we have further questions? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to, respond to some of the comments. Um, my view is this is a really good test case for community engagement and as you know, it's the, probably the largest engagement process that we've ever undertaken um, as a council. And um, even though as a council, you endorsed the community engagement plan, there are aspects of it in my and on reflection that I think we could have been clearer in, in developing the scope. I think that's a learning coming from this process we've just been through. The USA process has been used for around 10 years for the City of Adelaide. It's used by multiple levels of government and it's a recognised platform that is secure. But having said that, I think there are aspects to it that could be improved the way we use it. And, and I think that um, coming out of this, this process, it would be worthy of a review because I know that in my career in local government, every, nearly every consultation process you go through, there are different perspectives and different suggestions on how you should or shouldn't have conducted it. Um, I think developing a really clear scope, being very, very specific in how and what you're going to do is really important. This has been a lesson learned, from my point of view, this has been a lesson learned, and I will take that away and we will do some work on that. I believe that we need to have a, a really deep conversation about how we'll conduct ourselves in the future. I think this can be a, a, test, a, test, um, a test case that can enable us to have a really informed conversation. Um, having said that, I, I can put to you that the team that have been working on this have worked really hard using their best endeavours to provide you with the report that you've got. Could it have been better? Could it have been adjusted in certain ways? Maybe so. Um, the report that's coming to you next week is for noting. If that's not acceptable to you, you can direct that we undertake some further works or you can direct that we review how we do things in the future. Uh, we will, as, a, as an organisation, we'll respond to your direction. Um, I think that's probably all I could say, but I believe that, in my experience, community engagement, especially for very volatile and polar, polarising topics like this, are always problematic. Um, but I can say that the, the staff that have been involved in this have done it in good faith. They've provided you with a report that is as comprehensive as can be. And... I can give you the commitment that we'll do some review work as a part of this process. Thanks. Thank um, thanks. Um, thanks, Mark. I'm um, I'm encouraged by um, your response um, on that. And you know, I know we use your say, but I, I worry that some people have had no say at all because their feedback hasn't been included in the report. So you know, the, the opportunity for us to um, reflect on that and improve, I think, um, would be good. Thank you, Rob. And Councillor Chris. I'm off mute. Um, I think it's a, a little bit unfair to say um, and hit hard on administration to say that they didn't do the right thing by, by capturing the correct information. I think they did the best job they possibly could under the circumstances. It was a mammoth task. It was a huge task. The one thing that I'm very grateful for is that we've actually started to have these conversations. They are long overdue and I keep on saying that. And I do want to say um, myself as well to thank the administration for what they have done. And I know that it's difficult and I do agree with the CEO as well. I think we need to repeat, look back on how we could do better next time in regards to, you know, consultations um, in future. 
Um, I think it's really great that we've got two separate consultations. We've got the needs analysis and we've got to what, what the proposal, because at least we've captured all the information that we, that we need to go forward to talk further and workshop further what the Aquatic Centre needs, what the public want from it. And I'm really looking forward to have those, those workshops and those conversations, because that is what's most important. We all agree that we want to keep this centre running. And uh, the proposal from the AFC was only capturing um, the unsolicited bid process. We hadn't delved into it further. So no one really had formulated any real opinions. I know that there's some elected members that wanted to use as a political forum and I know they wanted to, you know, capture people into a group of a cluster and expose people as though they're wanting to destroy the aquatic centre. But that is fine. That is, that is their objective in their politics and that's fine. But, you know, we are doing a great job in creating those conversations and um, I do thank administration for doing their best in trying to capture whatever we can. Thank you. And we will go to Councillor Martin now. Yeah, a question for the administration. How much did these two consultations cost? I'm, I'm happy with the ballpark. 100, 200, half a million? I can't, I can't hear. Sorry, through you, presiding member. Uh, I'll take that on notice and come back to you. It wasn't a substantial uh, cost and it certainly wasn't a half a million dollars, but I will respond to the elected members tomorrow morning if that's possible. Thank you, Tom. And just before we go back to Mark, if you've got follow-ups, Ian Hill just wanted to comment. Ian? Oh, hi, can everyone hear me? Yep. Great, thank you. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, look, just on the um, Your Say website and that process, which is used widely by local governments, state governments and others, we have commissioned and did commission a, uh, a service review of what is best practice community consultation. Um, that, that piece of work has been received by our marketing and comms team and we're going through that as we speak. So tonight, it's obviously this particular Consultation is particularly um, contentious in the, in, the, in the eyes of the public. Um, that aside, looking at the best practice process that we can find for community consultations is really important. It's really important to our, to our organisation, it's really important to our reputation and it's really important to the staff that work on it. And these staff have been out front and centre talking to members of the public. So I'm a little bit disappointed about, uh, you know, who's, who's accountable and who's who's, uh, there's some an implication there, but at the end of the day, I can put hand on heart saying that uh, all the staff that I know are involved in this consultation um, have the interests of, of the organisation at, at heart. Uh, they're all part of a code of conduct and, and ultimately they're looking to do best practice consultation. So I'll bring back um, some feedback on that service review that we've done back into elected members. Um, and make sure you have full line of sight to uh, the review that we have done around community consultation as a process. Thank you, Ian. Councillor Martin, did you have any follow-up questions? Oh, just a rhetorical one. I mean, would you ever trust Team Adelaide with the parklands? Would you ever? Well, they did when they elected us, didn't they? Now, we'll go to Councillor Noel. Bingo, I mean, uh, Yes, and again, like everybody else has said, uh, thank you very much to the, well, the administration for all the work they've put in. And I think they have tried their best. And I mean, this, it's, uh, it, this is one of those issues where you have a lot of people with uh, the specific points of view. I mean, I do look uh, at this and say that the, the main objective as, a, as an elected member is that I have uh, opinions. It's not about numbers because we don't have a big enough uh, opportunity to get uh, people who are uh, you know, diverse enough and, and uh, in enough number, uh, cross-sectional to actually get any sort of uh, quantitative uh, information. But at least I have, or you know, in, if it's a pre, it's a pre-populated point of view, well and good. That is a point of view, and I think that's really good. And that, but the, in, unless people are expressing a variety, I mean, it is still only one one vision. And I think yeah, by capturing that, that's a, that's very good. I mean, let's face it, the majority of of councillors 
that uh, have been in this process. Uh, we don't have a point of view uh, one either, and I, look at, I appreciate that greatly that we've been given information because, end of the day, we are trying to um, put together, you know, a, a, an outcomes. And even though this is now not a, not one that's on the table for us, but I think it's really good that we've been able to get that and add that to the information that uh, we look at it, uh, collectively to see what is it we're going to do for our, our, uh, um, you know, for the public. And uh, you know, as someone who has stated many times, so, you know, I mean, I'm grateful when I don't have the opinion at this point that it's been helped to inform me. And it, you know, and I think that particularly the needs analysis, we could at least point way forward that if not for our council, but for the next council, we can do something. Anyway, that's it. Thank you, Councillor Noel. Councillor Stern. Thank you. I just wanted to. Um, a point of clarification, just to respond to Councillor Kouros's comment um, when she said that uh, some of those that have raised concerns about the survey were wanting to, you know, name and shame members of the community. It's not about that at all, um, but it's a fairly basic requirement of any public consultation that those who have made a submission in good faith have their views accurately recorded and included in the uh, report of that submission. That's all that is being asked here. It's not about um, naming and shaming people. It's just ensuring that their views have been accurately captured. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Catherine Murray. Oh, I just wanted to ask Ian. Um, I, I, he dropped out of a bit when he was um, giving his little talk um, a couple of minutes ago about the re reference to code of conduct. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. No, I, I think, sorry, Councillor Manman, just the imputation around the reputation of staff. And I, it was, it came across to me the way I understood some of the conversation earlier around, um, you know, how we roll out time and, and others putting their name to things. And I just wanted to reinforce to, to councillors that the staff here are incredibly professional and um, and community consultation is, is, is often a challenging one. And and particularly when you've got a, an issue that's a bit contentious. So um, I just wanted to reassure people that um, the merit and the, the professionalism of the staff here, at, and particularly in our marketing and comms around community engagement, is, is second to none from what I've seen working in both local government, state government and the federal government. Well, can I just comment on that, Ian? I think this was second to none, second to nothing. This is a bad consultation. I don't think the staff because the writing orders were clearly given you know, yes and no question. Clearly a good consultation starts with a yes and no question. Do you want this? Do you not want that? If you do, what are your provisos? Um, I think this was a poor consultation. I think that it came up with a result that was was, was asked for. Uh, listening to um, Councillor Kuros, it, it seemed that we are living in parallel universe here. Um, clearly the councillors, and there's a lot of talk about the staff being, the administration being very professional and fair and fearless. So, and we, we take the heavy burden of what the community wants, not the administration. You're, you are the, uh, the right of what we instruct. You were instructed to do something that was flawed. We understand that, but the result is, so we, there's no blame on you. The whole process was flawed right from the beginning when people refused to, do you want commercial offices on the parklands? That's right, you're, you're beginning to debate the topic. We can do that next week. Uh, well, I think do it, but it's difficult to know what commenting on a motion. This is this new, very difficult to know there is a motion or debating. What, what, what could you, explain what the difference is between that? Certainly. What you were saying was debating. What Councillor said before wasn't. What Councillor Kuro said before wasn't. I did give Councillor a little bit of extra room. Um, and a good friend, and I hope you appreciate that. Um, but parameters were debated and set. How I um, can comment without debating? Because I, I do not... Sorry, Councillor, you, you're also cutting out, which is making it hard to, to understand you. Could you explain to me the difference in uh, expressing your opinion on a report 
and debating. Could you explain the difference between those two? I would very much like to hear that. Well, it, it's at a point where it reaches where you're actually taking the items that other people have raised and you're having a to and fro with them. And that's exactly what you were doing. And you were also um, making reflections on the report um, and saying that other councillors in the room were in favour of it because they pushed this flawed report from the beginning, in your words, um, and that you were not blaming them and that you disagree with the report and that it's other councillors' fault. Um, but the implication was that other councillors, such as Councillor Sims and Councillor Martin and yourself, um, uh, were on the right side of the argument, essentially. So that is, that is the debate. Well, that, that uh, uh, with all due respect, presiding member, is my opinion on the report. And I wasn't reflecting on the staff. In fact, I was saying the staff were following the riding orders of the majority faction, of which I'm not a member. And I'd like to point that out very clearly and make that very clear to the public. Um, so I think what the answer really is that there's no difference between debating and commenting on a report and debating. There's absolutely no difference. There is, Councillor. And unless you have any further uh, comments to make or questions to ask, we're going to move to the next speaker. Um, Debating and everything that the team Adelaide does isn't debating. Could you make it clear what the difference is? I've just made it clear for you, Councillor Moran, if you wish to request a session with, with Rudy and the governance team out of out of this uh, current meeting, you're free to do that in your own time. We don't want to waste everyone else's time with that clarification. People have broadly followed the rules okay here. Captain the motion. I have it very clear. Thank you very much, Chair. Excellent. Councillor Sims. Thanks, uh, Chair. I do just want to make sure that um, I'd hate for administration to leave uh, the meeting tonight feeling that they're being made the whipping, um, the whipping boy uh, collectively for this process. Uh, so I just want to make it very clear that that's um, certainly not um, my view. Um, and to build on what Councillor Moran was saying, the fault doesn't lie with administration that have just followed the directions of uh, council. Um, the uh, the um, consultation was deeply flawed as a result of council's decision to omit key questions from the consultation process. We chose not to ask the community key questions, the threshold thank questions. You, thank you, Councillor Sims, but just on relevance, we're talking about the consultation. Well, I just want to clarify before we go on, it is a question. I just want to make sure administration understand that, that this is not having a go at them, that the criticism is of the process at uh, an elected member level. I am encouraged that um, there's going to be further discussion around developing a policy for this in the future, because I think that would deal with a lot of these issues um, and give clearer guidance to administration around um, how we approach consultations in the future, because we can't um, blame our executive arm for um, following a consultation process that was laid out by elected members, a deeply flawed one. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillor Martin, if you have a question, I'll allow it, but I'm not going to allow you to speak again. Or, or anyone who's already spoken for that matter. We've just spent too much time on this. We will be debating it next week. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd just like to know what was the process that led to the decision to exclude the APA feedback? What, what was the actual decision? I will pass to Sean. Uh, thank you through the chair. Um, effectively, uh, the quantitative data that we did the analysis on was the answers that were submitted through the Your Say platform. Um, which included those that were submitted in paper form. Um, so we were able to answer those questions um, and do the analysis from there. The APA pamphlet that was um, removed from those graphs, um, effectively the quantity is included um, and the question was pre-populated. So the analysis is that all of the answers were all the same strongly disagree because the quantity of the uh, pamphlet is the, is the answer to the question. So they haven't been compiled together and no different platforms were compiled together throughout the analysis. So they've all been separated. The Your Say ones are separate and included in the graphs. 
the upper pamphlet is separate um, and uh, that's the way that we decided was the best way to represent the feedback received through the various platforms. And a second question, how were you able to identify the responses uh, from the supporters of the Adelaide Crows who were invited by email to submit responses along a particular line in the closing hours of the poll? How were you able to identify those? And why did you include those? Uh, so all of the submissions through the platform were included. Um, so administration didn't get involved in inclusion or exclusion of um, any submissions throughout the different platform. Um, so, so the best way to answer that is that we included a piece of analysis um, to uh, assist councils in looking at that um, spike, if you will, uh, which is figure seven of the visitor summary by all responses, which is on the last page, page 17 of attachment A. Um, so you'll see that that is there to try and reflect um, exactly what you're pointing out, which is that um, throughout the course of the consultation, we received positive and negative spikes, if you will. Um, and uh, if the person went onto the Yorsay platform um, or received the paper copy, they're given the opportunity to choose if they'd like to consume the information on that site, uh, as opposed to if you have a look at the APA pamphlet, which is included in the report uh, in Appendix 2, um, the information is quite limited. The space provided to provide comments is limited. It's pre-populated with an answer. Um, so that's the real difference between the two um, mediums, if you will. I guess that's, that's why we've split them. Yeah, I understand that. I guess the question is, if... Your if the, you can take the rest of my Well, uh, okay. Well, I guess you'll probably mute me anyway, so there's no point in continuing. Excellent. Thank you, members, for your contribution. And now that I'm unmuted, we're going to move on to item 53, child care. Facilities. I'm going to take this item as read and ask members if there are any questions or comments. Uh, Mark's got a, wants to preamble it. Oh, Mark, if you want to preamble it. No, there was nothing I agree with. So take it as read. Thanks. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Uh, look, I won't be debating this tonight because it falls very short of um, what the Lord Mayor and I anticipated when we started this process. Uh, so tonight is not the um, venue to discuss it. I would, it, it falls very short of what uh, Sandy and I dreamed of, um, but we'll probably have another go at that some, at some other, other time. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members? Sorry, I was just muted. Uh, muted. Uh, we're going to move on to item 5.4, um, Amendments to Heritage Incentives Scheme Operating Guidelines. Um, and I've got the Lord Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I'm just not sure if Shanti's on for... Is she? So I just wanted to clarify one of the things that... Um, we were looking at or we we're hoping to achieve by the Heritage Incentive Scheme. Um, Councillor Kouros and Councillor Martin and I um, went to a meeting quite a while ago with St Peter's Cathedral. And part of the discussion was how they may be able to have some um, sense or some security that they could do a longer term uh, upgrade of their um, of the cathedral, uh, that they could actually look over several years or multiple years for uh, over the heritage incentive scheme so that they'd have surety that they could continue with the redevelopment and the um, uh, particularly around the heritage. Um, so I just wanted to check with Shanti that we could achieve this through the changes that are now in that, which is sort of triennial funding or something along that line. Um, through the chair, um, the, one of the intentions behind uh, the amendments to the operating uh, guidelines is to facilitate 
uh, what we would refer to as um, rolling funding, in particularly in particular for um, larger projects such as such as St. Peter's, St. Peter's Cathedral. Uh, the, the, there's reference in in the documentation to projects such as um, the Beehive Corner project. All these projects are actually um, are quite substantial, both in cost and size. Um, and given that um, the fund is fully taken up year on year, the ability to be able to give surety to um, a building owner, whether, whether it's the church or private developer, um, that we can support them in an ongoing fashion um, is, is the intent behind this operating guideline change. Um, so uh, hopefully the way we've um, uh, changed, cha made changes in the operating guidelines will facilitate um, the ability for a rolling fund going forward. Okay, but obviously the, um, the budget uh, is a, an annual budget, so there would be some consideration by councillors to whether that was an ongoing fund. Through the chair, that's correct. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Councillor Martin. Thank you. Uh, look, just a question for the administration. I remember the workshop well uh, and the discussion. Uh, is there any variation to the operating guidelines as we read them uh, compared to the discussions we had? Shanti, you are unmuted. Uh, through the chair, um, the workshops that were held were regarding the heritage strategy. Um, the, the heritage strategy is, if you like, the umbrella framework to guide all of the actions um, that we as a council undertake in the space of heritage. So whether it be in the space of promotions or um, uh, in supporting building owners, let alone the listing of buildings. Um, the operating guidelines form uh, one element of the overall um, heritage strategy. Um, and yes, there are changes that are proposed with these operating guidelines to facilitate um, the ongoing funding of larger projects. Okay, and um, uh, um, additionally, um, is there any likelihood that any aspect of these operating guidelines will have to change with the uh, change to um, uh, the, the um, development rules in the state? Um, through the chair, um, the City of Adelaide's um, Heritage Incentive Scheme is bespoke to the City of Adelaide. Um, other councils have their own um, heritage incentive programs and the like. Um, it is not dictated to in any way, shape or form um, by, by the legislation uh, or the legislative changes that uh, uh, are on their way through the PDI Act. Um, what the PDI Act might do is um, alter um, the ability to list or delist buildings. Um, this operating guideline does not deal with uh, that particular issue. Uh, what this operating guideline does do is it facilitates a framework for council to make decisions regarding funding for, um, for heritage listed properties. And so if a property was delisted, obviously it wouldn't qualify. Yep, get that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, any further questions or comments on this report? No, there being none, we'll move on to item 5.5, five, which is the Adelaide Archery Club lease consultation results, which I'm going to take that as uh, read and ask members if there are any questions or comments. There being none, we'll move on to item 5.6, the Stables of Victoria Park lease assignment. Taking that as read and asking if there are any questions or comments. There being none, we're moving on to item uh, 5.7, City of Adelaide submission into the Federal Parliamentary Inquiry into Homelessness. Um, and uh, with that one, uh, I wanted to pass to Claire or Christy 
um, to see if they wanted to lead us in uh, first, just to update us on a bit of the background to this work. Uh, Christy, you're unmuted. Uh, on and, here, and Claire, sorry. Claire, you're also, you're also unmuted. I'll let you fight between yourselves. Uh, well, I'm here. Um, I can't see myself anywhere, but I assume I'm oh, somewhere. I think we can see you. Oh, okay. Um, so just a couple of comments. One is that the submission is obviously based on um, previous decisions of council um, over the last um, few months. Um, the second point to note is actually the parliamentary inquiry has been postponed until further notice. So um, uh, the federal um, inquiry um, understands that, you know, um, most um, NGOs and local government, state governments have other priorities at the moment and they expect the landscape in relation to homelessness to shift and change in the coming months. Um, and so the, there isn't now um, a, a deadline for a submission, but they do welcome submissions if they are endorsed. Um, and obviously we're continue, continuing to work with um, Capital City Council of Lord Mayors um, and Adelaide Zero to um, coordinate and support um, submissions uh, for those that do want to submit. So um, we often find that um, um, NGOs in particular find resourcing quite challenging at the best of times. So um, anything that we can do to help support that we have been doing. Thank you, Claire. Chrissy, was there anything you wanted to add or no, your hand's not up, you're all good. Councillor. Excellent, Councillor Sims. Thank you, um, Chair. Well, first, I just wanted to uh, say thank you to administration for the work on this. I thought it was a really comprehensive submission. Um, and as you say, uh, Claire draws on a lot of the resolutions of council over the last six to 12 months, but I, I thought made some really good points in terms of some of the issues that we're facing. So thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, Claire, in relation to, and it's not mentioned in the report, but it, it sort of emerged more recently. Uh, I was really pleased to see the state government is providing uh, temporary accommodation for people who are homeless uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, hotel accommodation, as I understand it, I think I heard there's about 200 people that have been provided with um, accommodation. I think that's a really terrific initiative. I guess I'm just wondering whether council has had any contact with the state government around what might happen once this pandemic recedes in terms of integrating those people into long-term accommodation, whether that's something that the state government has been looking at, because it strikes me as, as you know, a really great opportunity if people are given um, some short-term accommodation to then ensure that that relationship in terms of accommodation is not broken and that they continue to, to be housed once the pandemic is finished. I just wondered whether you had any thoughts on that or whether that's something that's being explored. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, so absolutely. Um, so latest numbers as of today, 265 people are now in um, temporary accommodation. Um, the working group um, has come together um, and is advising in terms of the individual support that is needed for each of these individuals so that they can be maintained in housing. So um, I understand that Housing SA um, has been working really collaboratively um, with each of the individuals. Case managers have been assigned um, and, um, and uh, additional housing is being sought so that it can become a more permanent solution for these individuals. So while they are in this temporary accommodation, everyone does acknowledge that that's not sustainable, that these individuals do need case management um, and the agencies are working really well together to try and um, make this a long-term um, solution for these individuals to get into permanent housing. Okay, yeah, that, that's fantastic. So just to be clear, the plan would be that once this pandemic is over, then there's a pathway for people to move into more permanent housing. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Great, thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. So, and just on that, um, Rob, so uh, obviously uh, working with the state government, that they're not in, it's not a quarantine arrangement, so people have the right to leave and, and do whatever they need to. Um, and some of you might know that um, 
the coordination of uh, food and service, le service delivery has been undertaken by a lot of groups, including the Adelaide Oval and the Convention Centre have stepped in and delivering over 10,000 meals a day at the moment. It's, it's uh, extraordinary what they've been doing. Um, so it's a matter of um, all of the groups have come together, as Claire said, and doing the welfare checks and making sure they've got essential services and food and the wraparound and all that sort of stuff, which is great. Um, and they're continuing to do that outreach. Because there's less people uh, in the city, as in people working from home, the visibility is higher. Um, not everybody that's on the streets at the moment is necessarily homeless. And so they're actually trying to get anybody who is homeless into that safe accommodation. And I share the concern as what happens once we're through COVID and come out the other side. Um, there's been some other things that they've done in terms of remote visitor response. So a, a number of family groups have come down from the remote communities and they're now being restricted from returning home. So, uh, because the borders are shut. So the um, housing authority has been working with Baptist Care uh, and their Mylor camp and the, I think it's Wearaway, isn't it, Claire, in Strathalbyn? Yes, it's Wearaway, yeah. Yeah, for safe places for um, women and children. Um, and then that allows everybody to sort of work with them. So everybody's been incredibly proactive in this space over this period and trying to make sure, obviously, that um, uh, that if anybody has got symptoms that they that SA Health is looking after them, but they've also been educating them in terms of social distance rules and the importance of keeping safe. So, um, and the teams from the council have been amazing working alongside SAPOL and the Zero Project and everybody else who's in that space. So, um, it's amazing what you can do when you have uh, accommodation available. Anyway. So that's where that's up to. The numbers are extraordinary, 264, and I'm not sure that any other state's doing it as yet. So that's all. There's a comment. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I was just saying uh, many states aren't doing it and people are looking to the City of Adelaide um, as a leader in this field as we already are. Councillor Moran. I think by the um, you know, very few pluses of the pandemic, Show that homelessness is not a, um, a difficult problem to solve. We've been um, trying to get people sleeping rough off the street for decades, many decades. Um, but now it's showing that there is uh, accommodation available and 265 people up from 211 days ago are now housed. And then you can deal with the other factorial problems that they have. So I think no longer we can put up with, I think the lesson we've learned here is that we do not have to put up with our vulnerable people sleeping rough in King William Street, that there are, is motel accommodation, service accommodation available, and the pandemic showed us this. And uh, I don't think we'll ever put up with, uh, once this um, week has passed, we'll never put up with uh, leaving our um, poor, mentally ill and addicted out in the streets ever so that's one very small but significant plus learning from this um, catastrophe. Councillor Sims. Oh, your hand was up. Is it, is it no longer up? It's still up. Yep. Uh, we will bring you back. Uh, just give us a sec. Come right down the bottom. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah, look, I totally uh, agree with those comments. I think um, what's always been true about homelessness is that when there is the political will to solve it, it can be solved. And the fact that accommodation is being provided is really, really fantastic. Um, and I'm really pleased to hear the update that you provided there as well, Lord Mayor, in terms of that information and the work that is being done. I think that is really, really encouraging because we know that once people have a, a long-term roof over their head, then all of the other issues that they're dealing with can also be addressed. That really integral part of, um, of uh, providing support to, to people that need it is getting a roof over their head and a, a place to call home and a fundamental human right in my view. So yeah, I'm really pleased about the work that's been happening. So you know, thank you to administration, Claire, to your team, 
um, for the work you're doing working with the state government and um, and also yourself, Lord Mayor, and everybody else that's been involved with this because um, I think that's a really, as Councillor Moran has said, that is one silver lining from the terrible situation we're, we're going through at the moment is that it is highlight, highlighted um, that solutions can be found for this crisis. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Are there any other members who wish to speak? Um, before we move on, I might just um, uh, ask a question, uh, I think, um, of, of Claire. Is it, considering, and as you highlighted, um, it's obvious that we've, um, well, for the time being, more or less fixed this problem somewhat. Of course, I would note that numbers are still prevalent in the city. Those are more so mental health issues where people actually do have accommodation, but they're not using it for whatever reason. Um, but given, given that 250 odd people have been housed, and that's, as I understand it, a lot of people off the by name list, um, uh, and that we are leading that work, um, and the government will be faced with a problem eventually um, where you know, it'll come to a point where they're no longer providing hotels for people, but we can see that homelessness is an easily fixable problem. I just wanna ask, because the, because the inquiry has been delayed, could the report be beefed up and added to by um, letting it sit for a few months and then putting in there what we've learned from this situation and taking away these learnings and saying, well, potentially, well, actually, it's not hard to get um, people, into, people into accommodation um, when we need to, and that stops them falling through the gaps. Um, but what it actually shows is we've got mental health issues, for example. You're, you're unmuted, Claire. I think you're... Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry, I've got Christy with me, which is oh, uh, causing a, a bit of an echo. Um, so just to confirm, um, of the 265 that have been um, housed temporarily, um, 150 of those are from the by name list. Um, and absolutely, with the inquiry now on, on hold and on pause, um, I think what we would um, be keen to do is actually see how well um, and how sustainable the current approach is. So it's, you know, while people um, do have a roof over their head, um, what we all know is that that's just the first start and it's actually how successful the other services that are then um, brought in to help sustain that. And each um, individual has um, individual needs. So um, I think uh, leaving this report here, um, pause it, um, then absolutely, I think in the coming weeks and months, um, and um, once the inquiry is up and running, there will certainly be more insights and data to be able to help inform, um, you know, a, a, a national approach. Um, sorry, I did miss part of that end of the question because I was getting feedback from... Um, no, that's right. That, that answer, um, so the response satisfies me quite well. Did Christy wish to add? She's got a hand Christy? up. I'm not sure where she, she went running out. Okay, no, that's okay. Um, you add anything. You can just right, we can... Can you unmute me? There you are. Go. Thank you. I just wanted to let you know that to, today I did um, talk to other cities around the country um, who are also working in this area. And it was very pleasing to see that Adelaide is indeed leading the way. It would be great if this submission uh, next week, if this submission is passed by you so that we can include it once the inquiry is open again. But in the meantime, the CCE CLM group will document what's happening around the, Australia and put in a, another submission altogether based on what we've learned about what, how quickly a crisis can help this situation. But I, I'd like to point out that at the moment, um, only two other cities are putting people in hotels, and we're definitely leading in, in that sense. Understood. Thank you, Christy. Um, members, were there any other contributions or questions? There being none, we'll move to item 5.8, the e-scooter update report. And, and I'll pass to Rudy to give us a preamble on that. I think uh, you're yep, ready to go. Yep. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, Good evening, members. This report is just a status update report on the e-scooter complaints received from Beam and Ride. Um, we've uh, presented reports to Council uh, on that matter before. So just quickly running you through the history of that. 
uh, December 2019, Council concluded the expression of interest for the e-scooter services on Council roads. Um, following that, two complaints were received from BEAM and then subsequently from RIDE. Um, that was on the EOI process. Um, we then obtained external legal advice, which confirmed that there was no basis to the allegations made by both BEAM and RIDE. Um, following that, we received the Section 270 grievance from both BEAM and RIDE. Um, then on the 10th of March, Council at its meeting resolved to appoint Kane lawyers to assist with uh, a review and provide recommendations on the next steps. Um, we now received Kane lawyers' recommendations on this, and their recommendation is to proceed with a full merits review um, as part of the Section 270 process. So this report is just presented to you as a status update. The existing council decision still stands to continue uh, with the Kane lawyers engagement to finalise the Section 270 review. Happy to take any questions. And I've got uh, Brett Carland here as well, who um, is able to um, provide support as well with uh, the questions you may have on this, Madam. Um, I, that was very muffled, Chair, but I'm assuming that you uh, uh, referred to me. Um, just a couple of questions in relation to the attached document from Kane Lawyers. Uh, and I refer to the first paragraph, the role of the reviewer council. The council referred to is the elected body or council as a whole? Um, that is the elected body. Okay. And therefore, in framing that role of the reviewer, that is the elected body, have, has there been any discussion with council about these things? Yep. So uh, on the 10th of March, there was a report presented to council on this matter. And that's where council resolved to appoint external lawyers, Kane lawyers to assist with the review and provide recommendations on the next steps. So that was a report presented to council on the 10th of March. Okay, so we're being asked then to approve these steps that Kane lawyers are going to take, or you're assuming that that was approved at the 10th of March meeting? So on the 10th of March, Council resolved to appoint Kane lawyers to um, assist with the review. Uh, the review is what they've just uh, put in the uh, attachment. That's the scope of the review that they recommend uh, is to be undertaken and council resolved on the 10th of March to do exactly that. So this report is just presented for noting it's not requesting an additional approval from council on this. Uh, okay, but the terms of reference in, in effect have already been approved. That's what you're saying? Uh, the approval for council was to indeed undertake a section 270 through Keynes lawyers and uh, Keynes lawyers got back to us with a uh, much detailed scope of work on that, which completely sits within the uh, full merits review of a section 270. No, I, I understand that. I, uh, what I'm trying to get at is who determined the terms of reference? Was it the elected body on the 10th? Was it Kane lawyers? Or what input has the administration had in? Oh, that's a proposal from Kane lawyers, fully ind independent, independent of us. Okay, so Kane lawyers are telling us what the terms of reference are going to be are they going to come to council for approval or is that uh, document attached taken as approval when it comes to us at the meeting next week? Um, so Kane Lawyers was provided with uh, a request following council's decision to uh, provide recommendations and undertake the review. Um, Kane Lawyers have subsequently um, looked into that and um, got back to us with the scope of work, which is uh, attached here. Uh, that's something that the administration has not provided any uh, input to. That is what Kane Lawyers, Kane Lawyers is their best um, recommended course of action, which they believe would um, tick all the boxes in undertaking a full merits review under Section 270. So it is their recommendation that this is what's been looked into to fully um, undertake and comply with a full merits review under Section 270. Okay, got it. All right, so this is Kane Lawyer's uh, recommendation. Correct. Um, I, I note that there's nothing in there about recommendations flowing from any possible adverse finding. Um, 
w would you expect that to be there, perhaps as I under um, 2.2? Well, Section 270 typically uh, comes back with uh, recommendations for Council, whether that is a policy amendment or uh, whatever else may, may flow out of that. Um, that is exactly what Section 270 uh, is there for. Um, so I suspect that if that's indeed the case, that Kane lawyers will certainly provide recommendations to Council on that. Would it be appropriate, as this report is Council's request, that is the elected body's request, to ask them specifically for any recommendations flowing from any possible adverse finding? Um, well, Kane Lawyers will have to review all the documentation and information and, and everything associated with the decision making. So if there is any uh, um, process failure that they may identify, uh, that will indeed be incorporated in their review. Okay, and it wouldn't be prudent to request them to do that specifically? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, certainly willing to make that uh, abundantly clear when we um, formalise this, uh, this scope with them. Uh, but I think that is pretty much implied because that's what the Section 270 is exactly for. But um, okay. I'll take your point, Councillor Martin, and we can certainly make that abundantly clear when we communicate with Kane lawyers on that. Okay, and just one final question. Uh, they say their fee is uh, $50,000, including GST, but it's, it's not a quote, merely an estimate. Uh, do you expect it'll go substantially higher than that? or um, I can't uh, anticipate that, but uh, indeed their fee estimate is $46,110 um, at this point in time. Um, as always, um, as part of a legal engagement, we will uh, follow every step along the way and keep an eye on legal expenditure as it evolves. Um, it is an estimate. Um, it is, of course, a very big process. It's uh, quite a big engagement as well. So um, I understand that, therefore, it's very difficult for Kane lawyers to uh, provide a, a, a very detailed and final quote on that. At this point in time, it's an estimate, uh, but we'll be working with them to, um, to make sure that um, that is being monitored as we go. Thank you. Any other members? There being none, uh, we'll move on to the next um, item, which is, uh, well, actually, before we move on to exclusion of the public, a lot have asked me um, for a comfort stop, and we also need to take this time um, in order to um, remove staff who aren't meant to be in here for confidential items once we come back. So I would have a but break first. but um, uh, we do need a comfort stop, so um, we'll go for five minutes, I think, if everyone's happy with that. Um, uh, we're not going to close the meeting, by all means stay here, but um, we don't need to see you while we're, while we're suspended just right now, just for five minutes.